You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses and star teacher at Rochester Middle School. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today is December 11th, 2022, and this is episode 203 of Lighthearted. We have two guests today, Emma Choi and Kylie Lowe. Both of them are hosts of extremely popular podcasts. I was on their podcasts, and I thought I'd return the favor. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, First, Michelle, how's your holiday season going? It's going pretty well. Um, I'm almost done my Christmas shopping, which is kind of unheard of for this this early in the season, but um, we have our Christmas tree up, but with a new kitty, there's no ornaments on it. We're just, just the lights and that's it. We're just going to go with that this year. Yeah. Yeah. We were in the same, same boat as far as that goes. We can't have a tree or anything with our cat. Our cat Eddie would, would uh, pull the tree down probably yeah. in a few minutes, but uh, we have a, like a garland uh, fi- higher up on the wall with some ornaments and stuff where he can't get it. Pat have to household. improvise a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. So let's get to today's interviews. Our first guest will be Emma Choi, who is the host of a popular national public radio podcast. Let's tell everyone a little bit more about Emma. Sure, Jeremy. Emma Choi is a comic and writer and host of the weekly short form comedy podcast, Everyone and Their Mom. In 2021, Emma joined the NPR program, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, as an intern. She worked with the Wait, Wait team to create the podcast Everyone and Their Mom, which began airing in February 2022. Emma's plays have appeared in the DC Fringe Festival, and her short fiction has been featured in print and online. She's currently a senior at Harvard University. Emma is set to graduate in 2023 with a major in English, and she claims a minor in tomfoolery. She's from Vienna, Virginia, and she's a proud second-generation Korean-American. Yeah, I can confirm the Tom Foolery part, having uh, been on her podcast oh, at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. Yeah, uh, Emma came, as I said, to Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse in October. I got to take part in that fun recording session for her podcast, kind of a Halloween-themed episode. We talked about the ghost stories at the lighthouse. Uh, in the interview we're about to hear, Emma and I talked about her first visit inside a lighthouse and also about her ideas for attracting a more diverse audience to lighthouses. So let's listen to that conversation now. Thank you so much for being with me today, Emma. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, You were nice enough to have me on your podcast very recently at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. So I thought I'd return the favor and have, have you on. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Jeremy. It's so good to see you again. Likewise. It was a lot of fun meeting you and your friend Ava and also uh, Wilder, right? Wilder. The, the yeah. sound guy, uh, uh, at Portsmouth <laughs> Harbor Lighthouse a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed listening to the episode of the podcast that was, was put together. It was a, a lot of fun. I, I very much enjoyed being part of it. Uh, so before we talk about your experience at the Lighthouse, I'd just like to fill in a little bit for our listeners. Hard to believe that anybody might not be familiar with your podcast, but just in case, there's anybody out there. Can you explain a little bit about what your podcast, Everyone and Their Mom, is uh, and what it is about? Yeah, it's it's a it's a wild time. It's a companion podcast to NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which I think a lot of people know from the airwaves. Yeah. Um, but basically, Everyone and Their Mom is like a 20 minute show where we take a Wait, Wait panelist. We talk about one really awesome, weird news story and then go kind of ham with it. So your episode, we were talking with Mo Rock about lighthouses. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, we ended up talking to a ghost in the Portsmouth Lighthouse. And it was really fun. Yeah, it was. And I I enjoyed listening to that. I enjoyed the fact that Mo Rocco was part of the episode as well, because I've certainly been a fan of his since his daily show days. Oh, yeah, he's great. He's so nice. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's pretty funny. Uh, so, uh, a little bit more, uh, about you, how, how did you get started with NPR? Um, I was an intern in 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, it just expanded from there. Now I'm a host. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. It really (laughs) is. Yeah. Congratulations on that. I think it's, it's really, really impressive. Obviously you're 
Yeah, obviously you're good at what you do. That's pretty obvious. Uh, and people should listen to everyone and their mom. So you're a, a senior at Harvard, right? Yes, sir. And what are you studying? I'm studying English. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> I majored in English until I switched to uh, filmmaking a uh, million years oh, ago. Oh, yeah. a lot of crossover there. Oh, abs absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, a lot of great lighthouses in literature and film, actually. Yes, absolutely. Have I you talk read about, To the Lighthouse? I saw the movie The Lighthouse a couple of times in theaters when it was playing. <laughs> have, yeah. um, have you read To the Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf's book? Um, I could lie and say that I have. <laughs> But you should read of, it. Yeah, you've actually read it from cover to cover. I have. I'm a I'm a wolf fan. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, why we'll you're at Harvard. And, um. Yeah. I I should I should try it. I I can't say I give it a, a good enough effort. Uh, quite a few years ago. So <laughs> I promise you, I'll give it another shot. Uh, but I do quote it occasionally. There's a great quote uh, Virginia Woolf made about um how lighthouses signify our uh, isolation, but also our connectedness to each other. Mm. I love that quote. I'm not getting it precisely right, but uh, it's it's a quote. I've, in fact, I have it on the front page of my website, which is New England Lighthouse. Nice. Like that. I have the Virginia Woolf quote on there. So, <laughs> so I do love that. So anyway, let's get back to what you uh, what we just did uh, getting together at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, doing an episode of your podcast there. Uh, for anybody who hasn't heard it, it was just released a, a few days ago, that episode. The main thrust topic was Lighthouse Ghosts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, was that topic your idea? Yeah, I mean. Was um, it? It was, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we the way our show works is we just have one story and then we bring the panelist on and just let the conversation go wherever it wants to go. Yeah. Um, and it very kind of immediately went towards lighthouse ghosts because I guess we, we taped it in October and ghosts are just like on the mind during Halloween season. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, like me and my producers were like, okay, well, we're, we love this idea. We definitely have to go to a lighthouse now. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was just a ton of fun. And also like, I wasn't expecting how beautiful it would be too. So I got kind of distracted from uh, the funny side, just being in awe at this lighthouse. Yeah. Uh, your producer, uh, Haley Fager, am I remember your name right? Yep. Uh, Haley and Kelly are, are two of yep. our producers. Yep. Yes. Haley contacted me and was asking about, is there a lighthouse, you know, that I would suggest that, that you do this at? And I said, mm -hmm. well, how about the one that's 10 minutes from my home? Of course, with Harbor Light. <laughs> You know, I have the key. It's a, uh, it's handy. It's a, it's my home away from home for the last 20 years or so. So it was, it was great having you there. Uh, and was it your first time visiting a lighthouse? First time inside one for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it was hollow. <laughs> I don't know why I expected there to be more stuff inside, um, uh -huh. but it was, it was awesome. I guess it was, you were saying that it was one of the smaller lighthouses, right? Yeah. Um, when you say expecting more stuff inside, there are some lighthouses where people lived inside the towers. Right. This is not one of those. The, the lighthouses where people lived inside the towers would tend to be one like off on the rocks or whatever out in the ocean because there was no room for a separate house. But at Portsmouth Harbor Light, there's a, a comfortable keeper's house nearby. So there was no need to live inside it. So all you have is that spiral stairway inside, which I think is quite, quite beautiful, really. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why there's not a whole lot of stuff inside there. Uh, but what were your impressions getting inside a lighthouse for the first time? I don't know. I think that, well, it was such a beautiful day, you know, like that yeah. day that we visited, it was like a perfect new England peak foliage, like 60, 55 degrees. And like, I, I think I expected like what I'd seen from the movies, like the kind of lighthouse you live in, but like being in there, like for the first time I, I like really thought about lighthouses as like a place of utility, you know, mm -hmm. like um, like a tool rather than a place to live, which is really interesting. I was talking to my sister, actually. My sister is in the Navy. She's a ensign. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about like lights and then lighthouses and how important that is on the sea. Because I feel like a lot of people, like I always forget that like something as simple as like a light shining can be like life or death. And yeah, that was, I think that it was really powerful being inside there for that reason. You like, it made you think about like all the history associated with this one like structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's really well said. Uh, 
if uh, somebody's, of course, people listening to this podcast are mostly lighthouse nuts. So they're we're <laughs> most, mostly preaching to the converted here. But if you were talking to a friend who knew nothing about lighthouses and had never thought of them for a second in their, their lives, <laughs> would, what would you say to uh, maybe urge them to, to go visit a lighthouse? Anything you would want to tell them? Okay, this is going to sound silly, Jeremy, but like, I've never been in that shape before, you know, like, you think you've seen all the rooms, you know, you've mm -hmm. seen semicircle, you've seen square, rectangle, hell, yeah. I've even been in an atrium before, but I've never been in that shape of room that is a lighthouse. And I didn't, I was expecting it to be cool, but it was really cool. I think my mm -hmm. favorite part, though, was seeing the light, you know, at the top, yep. which there was like, it's like both, it's like an art piece because it's like sculptural and glass and beautiful. Yes. But it's like, whoa, that's a light. Like, it's just like, it brings out the childhood joy in you. Like, you know, when you're like a, a toddler and you mm -hmm. see a big truck, you're like, whoa, truck. Like, I felt like a four-year-old being like, that is a huge light. And I like it just because the way it is. Yeah. And that was great. Yeah. 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 I always say the lenses, the Fresnel lenses, like we have, of course, with Harbor Light, are mm -hmm. uh, beautiful works of functional art. Yes. Uh, and I grew up in the Boston area, and I would, I'd love to go to the Boston Museum of Science. There mm -hmm. was a gigantic lighthouse lens on display there when I was a kid, which came from the Navisink Twin Lights in New Jersey. And that lens is back at the, its original site on display at the Twin cool. Lights. Uh, site there but when I was a kid I saw this huge lens and I had no idea really what you know I didn't understand how it was used or anything but I just thought it was the most incredible thing I was just fascinated by it so I like to think that's how I I first got interested really Aww. yeah yeah so I'm glad to hear you say that that you were impressed but impressed by the lens because I think they're oh, they're definitely. pretty pretty special uh so uh of course again the the main topic we talked about that day was lighthouse ghost stories and uh we we made an attempt to sort of contact uh captain card joshua card the long time yeah, keeper of portsmouth arbor light who died more than 100 years ago uh so what do you think what did you come away with do you think the lighthouse is haunted i don't know i mean <laughs> i think that like i think that like going in I was open to the idea, like I hadn't ruled it out. And coming back out, I felt largely the same, you know, was I expected like, okay, there's no way there's going to be a ghost. Like I was expecting to leave with kind of some kind of like closure, but I left being like, huh, like, I don't know, could have been, could have, might not have been, but like, I haven't, like it, learning about Captain Card and like how attached he was to this lighthouse, it makes sense that like some part of him would stick around and like, stay there you know and i think that's i think it's a lovely thought i think so too and you're echoing very much the way i feel about about all this i like like to call yeah. myself an open-minded skeptic you know yeah <laughs> i'm not sure we can reach any firm conclusions but i certainly uh having heard a voice in there myself which i think i told you about i can't yeah, i did. can't deny that there's a possibility there's something uh, very very real happening there but mm -hmm. um let me let me change the subject a bit here uh, to really change the subject, still related to lighthouses, but those of us in the lighthouse world uh, are always struggling with this, this question. The question is how to get younger people involved in lighthouses, and part, part two of that uh, is how to get a more diverse uh, audience or, you know, diverse people involved in lighthouse mm -hmm. preservation and research, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, first of all, I'm 66 years old. I'm probably younger than the average age of lighthouse staff and volunteers around the country. I would say pretty, pretty definitely am. I'm just a kid compared to, to a lot of them. Uh, our, uh, the U S lighthouse society, which this podcast is for, uh, has been making a big push on social media recently, uh, TikTok and Instagram and stuff and Facebook. Uh, the problem with that, that, that I I'm seeing is that, you can get people to look at a picture, like say on Instagram, mm -hmm. or maybe look at a little video on TikTok or something, but that's basically all they're going to do. They're going to look at it for a few seconds. They're going to like it or heart it or whatever. Um, but to get them to take another step and actually visit lighthouses and to go even farther than that and get involved in some way as a volunteer or uh, you know, to, to support lighthouse preservation in some way, that's a whole other story. 
Um, mm-hmm. So we're always trying to get word out to you know people in their teens, 20s, and 30s, also more diverse people. Uh, most of us are old white guys <laughs> in this <laughs> in this field. There's women too. There's quite a few women too. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I would love to see a younger, more young people get interested because we're not going to be around forever. Also, more uh, diverse people. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts and all that. How? Any suggestions? Uh, yet, yeah, no ideas are too crazy. Uh, how do how do we get more different kinds of people involved? I don't know, Jeremy. I got some crazy ideas. Good. Um, but I think, I don't know, like it never hurts to throw a party, you know, just get people to come for, to be around something cool, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I mean, on the very practical side, I just, like, I didn't even know that you could go inside of a lighthouse to visit. And I just like think like for anything, like I think more things, that's why I love public radio, which I work for is because like, it's so accessible and mm-hmm. like more people can access it. So I feel like if people knew how to enter these lighthouses, like if the tour, like if tours were like listed publicly in big print, like of course where people would go, you know? Um, but, you know, and also like events, like, um, like, uh, you know, what's it called? Um, the bird watching, bird watching is becoming like a huge Gen Z millennial thing, which used to be, yeah. you know, dominated by like old white people. But now like, you know, it's for everybody because people love nature and being together. And I think like, creating communities where it's not just like come be part of our community but come make your own community like come you know sleep over at a lighthouse for a night you know or like I don't know a rave around a lighthouse tons of lights you know like (laughs) and building something new um I think is just as effective or even more effective at finding new people interested in this stuff than trying to accumulate them into existing activities um, and that's something my show is all about too. You know, like we're we're trying we're asking the question like, how can we get a new community involved in an establishment like wait mm-hmm. wait you know which wait wait's kind of like our lighthouse and we're like the rave around it. So uh, it's a it's a it's a big question, Jeremy. And like I I don't know, but yeah yeah they're cool. Well, I you've got some good ideas, and I'm I, believe me, the door is always open. If some if you're just sitting around one day and all of a sudden the light bulb goes off, the light the the canal <laughs> lens in your head goes yeah. up, and you get some idea along these lines. By all means, I'd love to hear about it. I like your idea of of parties at lighthouses. I mean, there are events held at lighthouses in, in various parts of the country. Uh, a lot of them are open to the public, but. Um, you know, some of them will have uh, music at a lighthouse, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we can do more with that. I think just calling it a party is actually, you know, that's something that's not usually done. Just just have a party at the lighthouse yeah. just and just have chairs out and some food out and people can just hang out and enjoy themselves <laughs> on a beautiful day. What better way to uh, to get to know a, a beautiful place like that? So yeah. I, 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 I like that idea. <laughs> Hey, yeah. if you, it's like, uh, what is it? Field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. If you give them alcohol, they will come. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny you say that because I've said many, many times when I've been at various lighthouses and, you know, some of them are open every day. A lot of them are not open at all. Some are open once in a while. The mm-hmm. ones that are open once in a while, I, I'll, I always say to the people, you know, yeah, if you open it, they will come. Um, so that's, yeah, I've, I've I've said that uh, quite a few times over the years. So let me ask you, uh, at this point, after your experience at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, are do you consider yourself a lighthouse nut at this point? <laughs> I don't think I've done enough to con- to qualify as a nut, but I'm definitely a lighthouse fan. You know, like Good. next time I'm in Cape Cod, I'll be visiting in all those lighthouses. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, excellent. I got your book on my shelf now. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lighthouse Handbook, New England. There it is. It proudly in your stack there. That's good. Mm-hmm. That's great. I hope it serves <laughs> you well. I hope you get to use it to visit some lighthouses. My boyfriend's actually very excited to do this. Like he has uh-huh. been interested in exploring. So, I, some people are very like my boyfriend loves like um, very specific, like long novels or like um, uh, histories about U.S. presidents. And I think that crowd and the lighthouse crowd share a lot of people in between. So uh, mm-hmm. we'll be checking that book out. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if you need yes. any advice, if you're going on a lighthouse trip and you need any pointers, you know who to ask. Oh, I have so. your number now. I'll be texting you. Excellent. I have one final question for bonus points for you. Okay. Okay. What's your favorite lighthouse? Oh, I'm basic. I'm basic. It's got to be the chip bag lighthouse. 
Oh, okay. Okay. I had to think <laughs> for a moment there. Chip bag lighthouse. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, you're sort of saying that Portsmouth Harbor light is a favorite one because those are actually twins. Yes. Uh, Nosset light on the potato chip bag. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute twin of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. Uh, they were yes. both at the same time. Uh, they're the same dimensions, except the, the Nosset light on the on the chip bag has the uh, mm -hmm. upper, the red upper half, uh, which it's is the pretty prettier unique. twin. You know, it's the Mary, yeah. Mary Kate and Ashley thing, Olsen twin thing, right? <laughs> yeah, but I respect I suppose. both of them equally. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if the Coast Guard's going to let us paint uh, stripes on Portsmouth Harbor Light to get more attention. I'm afraid <laughs> one day if you wear them down enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. When they're not looking, maybe we can throw some some <laughs> pink uh, polka dots on it or something. Oh, perfect! That would make it so much more visible. That'd be awesome. I'm sure Captain Card would love that. Well, a friend of mine who owns a lighthouse down in Fall River, Mass, mm -hmm. actually painted a red stripe around it, and then after the fact, got permission from the Coast Guard. Uh, but they loved it because it shows up better during the day. Yeah. And it actually, it looks fantastic. So it was a brilliant okay. idea. Yeah. Huge. So, so Could be giving huge. them giving them something unique like that is, is a, not a bad idea at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, Emma Choi, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure uh, meeting up with you at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. Pleasure talking with you today. I hope we can uh, stay in touch. And uh, like I said, uh, the uh, the channels of communication are always open if you have any lighthouse ideas or if you need any lighthouse tips. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Jeremy. What fun to be on. It's so good to see you. You can listen to Emma's podcast, Everyone and Their Mom, with your favorite podcast app or on the NPR website at npr.org. Our next guest, Kylie Lowe, is a podcast manager and content creator based in Portland, Maine. Kylie is the executive producer of the chart-topping Gold Digger podcast, and she hosts her own show, Dark Down East. It's a true crime podcast dedicated to the stories of Maine and New England, digging into the hushed hometown mysteries, long-standing cold cases, the sensational decades-old and modern-day crimes that prickle the history of the Down East and beyond. I've been on Kylie's podcast, Dark Down East, a couple of times. We recently did a Halloween season episode talking about the haunted lighthouses of Maine. It's been a pleasure being on her podcast. In the interview we're about to hear, we talked about her fascination with lighthouses and also her ideas about attracting young people to lighthouses. So let's listen to our conversation now. I'm here this afternoon with Kylie Lowe, and uh, Kylie is a podcast host and producer. And uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me today, Kylie. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited. I don't often get to just chat about things. Normally, I'm pretty scripted, as you know, on my show. So I'm so excited to be here. Well, great. And, uh, you know, I've been on your podcast a couple of times, your Dark Down East podcast, and it's been a real pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, working with you, and I thought I'd turn the tables today and ask you some <laughs> questions for a change. So, yeah, no, I'm grateful. So, of course, I want to talk about Dark Down East, and I do want to talk specifically about lighthouses uh, somewhat today, but maybe a little bit more about you. First of all, what got you started in your career in radio and podcasting? I have a very uh, roller coaster esque career. I, first of all, started off as a journalism student at the University of Maine, go Black Bears. And uh, that isn't actually what I thought I would do with my career. I applied to UMaine as a theater major and I got there and I kind of had this um, come to reality moment where I was like, wait a minute, theater isn't necessarily going to put food on the table. I had some, a reality check with myself. Um, but really at the heart of theater, what I loved was storytelling and entertaining an audience. And I thought, what can I pursue as a career that's going to scratch that itch, um, but put food on the table? So I pursued journalism and I just really, I loved seeking out stories, digging deeper, interviewing people, um, and getting to know them. I, but I did burn out on like traditional news pretty quickly um, because it's such a churn and burn cycle. And 
I wasn't necessarily telling the stories that are interesting to me. I was telling the stories that made a block news, you know? (laughs) Um, So I had this foundation of journalism. And after school, I actually went straight into marketing. I was a spokesperson for a financial institution. I was driving around the state in a bright green car, educating my peers on financial literacy, which looking back now, it's like, what did I as a 22 year old know about managing finances? Absolutely nothing. But I got paid to teach people how to do it. Um, And I had this really cool opportunity after that gig ended. It was a one year contract as this spokesperson. And um, then a friend of mine sent me a picture of uh, uh, Oreo cookies. And um, on the package was this contest to become a blogger and vlogger for the band One Direction, a pretty big band. Um, So I applied. It was like, you know, you see those contests on food packages or like advertised on TV and you're like, no one wins those. But you certainly can't win if you don't enter. Uh, So I entered the contest and won and got to go on tour with One Direction for a summer. And so, again, it was more storytelling. It was uh, more creating content, entertaining an audience, uh, bringing the concert experience home for fans who couldn't get to the arenas. And uh, it again, this roller coaster of like, what's my next big thing? How am I going to continue to tell stories? How can I pursue things that are interesting to me? And it's all been, you know, I've never really known my next step or the next thing I'm going to jump into, but it's always had a through line of, of storytelling. Um, and that's how I've ended up in podcasting from radio. I got off got off the road. I know you'll maybe ask me about this. I won't give you my whole career timeline in in one blurb. Uh, But uh, that's kind of the start was going from journalism to marketing to even refining it further and knowing that um, if I'm not speaking to an audience about something that's important to me, I'm not going to have a good time. And so that's how I've always kind of chosen my next step in my career. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's going to be exciting to see what that next step might be from here <laughs> down the road. Who knows? I know, if my boss listens, she's going to be like, "Don't go anywhere. This is your <laughs> final step." But <laughs> uh, so for a while, and I think maybe you were almost going to get into this a moment ago, but you actually co-hosted the top-rated morning show, uh, radio show in Portland for a yeah. while. And for the people listening, just be, to be sure they, they realize we're talking about Portland, Maine and not Portland, Oregon here. The original but, well, can you, Portland. Yeah. The original Portland. Absolutely. Uh, well, actually, in Portland, England would be the original Portland. Okay. Well, the original well. American Portland. <laughs> yeah, yes. Portland, Maine. So can you tell me a little bit more about that uh, experience, that radio show? Yeah. Talk about falling into a dream job. That was such a fun experience. I had just gotten off the road with One Direction and I've always had a passion for music, live music, going to concerts. At one point in my early 20s, I was going to at least one concert a weekend, if not multiple. And, um, you know, after I got off the road, I went back to a digital media, more like traditional corporate setting job, which was, it was great. I learned a lot of skills and um, got paid and got benefits and all these things, but it wasn't, it wasn't me. I don't really fit into a corporate setting. Um, And like I said, I was going to concerts every weekend and I was like, how can I, how can I do this for work? And who can I get in front of that will allow me to go to concerts and get paid for it? (laughs) Um, And I've always been a big fan of Q97.9, which is in Portland, the local top 40 music station. And so I sort of just kind of put my face in front of the powers that be and volunteered my time. Um, I actually started as a video producer earlier in my career before I got into audio exclusively, and they needed video production at a lot of their events. Some of those events were concerts. So I would show up with my camera, shoot content, uh, produce beautiful pieces for them that they would use on their website and their YouTube channel and all of that. And uh, so I kept doing that for free, like in my spare time, just because it gave me the access I wanted. And then in 2015, one of the co-hosts of the Q Morning Show, who had been there for decades, I mean, I had been listening since I was a kid to Meredith, Jeff and Lori, Meredith announced that she was leaving the show. And 
one day they asked me to come in, see if I wanted to hang out on the air. At this point, I had been, you know, showing up every chance I could for about eight months. And uh, they asked me to just come hang out on the air, just come hang out on the air, see how it goes with Lori and Jeff. Didn't tell me it was an audition, didn't tell me it was a job interview. I didn't even know there was a job to interview for. <laughs> uh, but after that first on air shift, I, I co hosted the show with them as a guest co host one morning. And um, they offered me the job that same day. How would you like to co-host the Q Morning Show? And telling that to someone who grew up with that station, with the legacy hosts, Lori and Jeff, if I got to sit in the third chair in that studio, I mean, it was the easiest yes ever. Um, so I, I co-hosted that show for, for three years, three and a half years. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, of course, I'm here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, so I don't listen to that that station as a rule. But I just uh, listened to a couple of days ago, heard a clip from the, the show, and it was fun to listen to. And, uh, you know, certainly the idea with, with morning top 40 morning radio shows in general is to sound like you're having a lot of fun and you guys sure sounded like you were having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it truly was fun. I mean, 4 a.m. wake up calls are pretty brutal. And I'm sure I took some years off my life, you know, being I was in my mid 20s. So I was very much in my going out, having fun time as well, but yeah. then having to get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I also met my husband while we uh, worked at the radio station together. So it was a very uh -huh. good job. <laughs> that sounds like it. Yeah, it's fantastic. So you are the executive producer of a podcast called Gold Digger, right? Mm -hmm. Which I believe is one of the most, uh, I, th I think you may have told me that it's the second highest rated business podcast do I have that right? Uh, can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So the Gold Digger podcast, G-O-A-L, is the number one marketing podcast. Gold in Digger. The yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Let me. Yeah. <laughs> I probably said that too fast. Not Gold Digger, but Gold Digger. Right. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Gold Digger podcast. It's hosted by Jenna Kutcher and I am the executive producer of that show. So I help keep it running and I help Jenna show up and, and sound the best she can and make our guests sound amazing. But it's a show dedicated to helping female entrepreneurs um, build their businesses, whether in, they're in the dreamer stage or they've been in business for 10 years. Um, and it's also in recent uh, months really evolved as a lifestyle show as well. So I've been producing that show um, for about four years. And that was my first dive into podcasting. I applied for the job having little to no podcast credentials, just knowing that I could probably re be really good at the job. And uh, again, applied on a Tuesday. By Friday, I was flying out to Minnesota where the host is based and I I got the job. <laughs> so um, yeah, number one marketing podcast in the country. So Number it, one. Yes. Very, number very. One. What did I, why did I think it was number two? Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. Number one marketing podcast in the country. We're something at like 80 million downloads. It's um, coming up on some big numbers here. Pretty well. I mean, it's already a big number, but to hit that hundred million download mark, we're looking at it by the end of the year. So it's, it's pretty insane uh, to be working yeah. on a show of that caliber. Absolutely. You know, if I feel like if I do uh, this podcast lighthearted for another thousand years, I might hit those kind of numbers. <laughs> hey, Delta, you never uh, know. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're, you know, it's a niche podcast, so I'm, I'm told we're doing pretty good, but I won't. Well, there's won't power. Go there's power in a niche podcast and maybe we'll get into it later. But um, my mm -hmm. show is also pretty niche and I've seen success there. So there's there's power speaking to someone specifically. Okay. I, I agree with that. Definitely. Uh, so you have been doing your podcast Dark Down East for, I believe, more than two years now. Uh, can you tell me what made you decide to do a podcast on kind of true crime stories in Maine? I was living in New York at the time. And to be honest with you, New York never really felt like home to me. I always felt homesick for Maine. And I never really knew how much I loved my home state until I didn't live there anymore. You don't know what you got till it's gone kind of thing. And I found myself in my most homesick moments seeking out content, whether it be books or TV shows or podcasts that were about Maine, based in Maine, you name it. I used to watch Maine Cabin Masters, my favorite shows. Um, but I was also interested in uh, the true, true crime. Of course, I produce true crime content, and that's the word that <laughs> trips me up. I have always been um, interested in true crime in that I wanted to understand the stories. You know, I'm I'm very interested in human stories um, and 
coming from like a helpful place, um, wanting to understand what they've gone through and in what ways I can support people who have experienced just like incredible trauma. Um, and so the true crime genre has always been of interest to me, especially with a journalism background. You know, that's a lot of what you report on and what you learn to report on is just like the most terrible um, times in a human's life. You know, how do you report on that in a way that's respectful? And so combining, you know, wanting to find content about Maine in a true crime podcast category, I was finding that Maine cases weren't getting covered. And the cases that were getting covered, um, hosts were mispronouncing town names and they weren't necessarily giving my home state that I love so much the attention and respect it deserved. And I kept thinking to myself, someone needs to make a Maine and New England true crime focused podcast. Someone needs to do it. And then I had a moment one day, wait a minute, I should do it. <laughs> I have all the skills and I, I clearly have the interest and passion. And so I dove in. The idea kind of collected dust in my brain uh, in early 2019 and I was planning my wedding and I just, I, I had this idea, but I didn't have the time um, to act on it. And then of course, March, 2020 hit and I accidentally moved back to Maine with my husband from New York city, thinking we'd be here for a long weekend. And then I mean, how many years has it been? <laughs> We've been here since. And um, it was in the midst of of the early stages of the pandemic where I said, okay, now's the time. I'm home. Um, I am back in my community. I'm back in Maine. And I can really do a lot with the skills that I have uh, to help these families who have experienced unimaginable loss and uh, many of them still waiting for answers and justice in these cases. And so that was really the the starting point for Dark Down East. As you're speaking about that and talking about the the people and and uh, how important it is to be respectful and sensitive to uh, telling their stories and that kind of thing, I'm thinking that with the Lighthouse podcast, I'm trying to tell the stories of the people. That's I mean that's what it's all about. I think with any podcast with storytelling of any kind, obviously it's of course it's, yeah of course. I guess that's obvious, but um, you know, with the, with lighthouses, we're not just talking about the structures. We're absolutely talking about people. And speaking of lighthouses, I know from speaking with you and being on your podcast that you have an interest in lighthouses. I was on recently and we talked about lighthouse ghost stories, uh, kind of a Halloween themed, uh, episode of, uh, dark down East. How did you first become interested in lighthouses? So I've always, I think similar to you, we talked about this uh, in the last episode we did on Dark Down East together, but I just have always had an appreciation for the ocean from a very early age. My grandfather was a lobster fisherman. My grandparents lived uh, in a little cottage in Booth Bay Harbor. And so the ocean had always kind of been there in my life. You know, Sundays were spent doing lobster bakes. I did not appreciate the access to lobster I had. I can tell you that much as a kid, having a grandfather as a lobster fisherman. Um, but I've always had a, an appreciation for the ocean. And my first visit to Portland Headlight, um, I was a preteen. And I just remember being in awe of the structure. I didn't know at the time, I must have been 11 or 12. I didn't know at the time, you know, how old it was or what the purpose was. I just remember standing at the base of the lighthouse and looking up and just thinking, this is, it doesn't look like a house. It doesn't look like an office building. It's just this unique figure there. And it, it took on for me, and this may sound woo woo to somebody who, who doesn't also have an appreciation for lighthouses, but it just, had like this spirit and this energy and this feeling. And even at a young age, I was really kind of taken by that. And I remember my parents told all of us kids that we could pick out one souvenir from the little gift shop there at, at Portland Headlight in Cape Elizabeth. And while my brother was running around looking to find like a toy car or something that had nothing to do with the lighthouse, you know, there's always like knickknacks and stuff at those uh, gift shops. I picked up this um, coastal ghosts and lighthouse lore, this book that I by Bill Thompson, William Thompson. Um, and I still have it and it's still on my bookshelf to this day. And I got this as a preteen just because I was so taken by it. And um, since then, my appreciation for lighthouses has only deepened because I had 
I've had more opportunity to see them from a different perspective. My husband, when we started dating, he had a boat, which was, of course, amazing. You know, get a boyfriend with a boat. He brings you out on the ocean to woo you. And uh, we would spend time on Casco Bay, uh, zipping between all the lighthouses out there and seeing them from the water, uh, again, really deepened my appreciation. And I was in awe of them and wanted to learn more about the history of them and um, their function and the stories behind them. And my appreciation for lighthouses is so great that we planned our wedding. I always said I wanted to get married at a lighthouse. We didn't get married at a lighthouse, but we took a boat to Portland Headlight and Portland Headlight was the backdrop of our wedding. Um, so they, they really are uh, important to me. You know, I would be lying if I said I was as well versed in the history as you, of course not. I'm not a lighthouse historian, but I just have, I think, a, a general appreciation for everything that they stand for and the purpose that they've served throughout, uh, you know, hundreds of years, really hundreds of years. They've outlasted so many humans that have um, occupied their walls. So that is my uh, my lighthouse love story right there. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. I love it. <laughs> Maybe you've already answered my next question to a large degree, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you anyway. Lighthouses are such a positive symbol in our culture. Obviously, everywhere you go, people love lighthouses uh, and they stand for hope and strength and guidance and all those, those great positive qualities. There's no doubt about that. But I also like to say they have a dark side. And I think you've uh, said that as well on your podcast. The, this kind of a dual identity, I would say, of lighthouses. There's the the beauty and the positive symbolism. There's also that mystery and, and the kind of the, the dark side. Do you have any thoughts about that? What um, What is most attractive to you about lighthouses? Is there one side or the other that kind of uh, mm. pulls you or is it, is it equal? I think it's equal. And I think humans, well, I can't generalize all of us, but certainly for me, I romanticize the thought of a lighthouse the opportunity, if it were ever to arise, to spend the night at a lighthouse and to wake up with the surf crashing on the rocks and just the feeling it would give me to be reading my lighthouse ghosts and lore book while sitting in a lighthouse. You know, the dark, the darker side, those legends that have built up around lighthouses are certainly interesting to me. Um, but I think just the reality of life as well for a lighthouse keeper, um, for everything the lighthouses have seen throughout the years, you know, weather, um, storms, and then the human life, the people coming to visit nowadays, but also the people who actually lived there. I think that's the positive side of it. And that attracts me to them as well. Uh, but I think they're certainly, I romanticize them in my eyes. I mean, they're just, um, they're beautiful. My When we moved back to Maine, uh, speaking of, you know, the pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic, we moved into this one bedroom condo and from the window in the living room. It was on Munjoy Hill in Portland. And I could see three lighthouses right in a row. And it was like, what a treat for someone who loves lighthouses. And it doesn't, I, it's quite far away from Portland Headlight, but I could see that light flashing. You know, you can catch it out of the corner of your eye. Um, and so I, it's like this ever present thing uh, if you live in the Casco Bay area. Um, so I certainly romanticize the image of a lighthouse and just the stories that must be living in those walls uh, that have yet to be told. Yeah. As you're saying that, I was just thinking, you know, I was saying a minute ago about the sort of dichotomy, the two sides of lighthouses, kind of the light and the dark, but maybe they're not so separate. They're very much intertwined with each other. And Certainly. life at these places was beautiful. It was also scary and dangerous. It was it was both. Uh, so, um, you know, they can be both things at once. Absolutely. You know, I, <laughs> someday I'd love to just like, I'll probably have you back on dark down East at some point, if, you know, it may be a true crime podcast, but one of the benefits of having your own show is you can talk about whatever you want, whenever you want. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, but I just, there's so many more stories that I'm sure are locked inside your brain about these, uh, lighthouses, um, that mix the light and the dark. Um, and so again, I would love to dig back into those though. That's what gets me excited is that there's always something more to learn 
And history has never been my strong suit, but when history is approached through storytelling and through the eyes of the humans that experienced it, I think that's when you can learn the most. Yeah. Let me ask you something else I've been thinking about and something we think about all the time in the Lighthouse community. Those of us in the Lighthouse community, Lighthouse preservation, uh, Lighthouse history, every, everything uh, in the field, you know, we're always struggling to get more young people and basically a more diverse, both in terms of age and all kinds of demographics, get more different kinds of people interested in lighthouses. But uh, I would say especially uh, younger people. I mean, a lot of us uh, who have been, I've been doing lighthouse stuff for like f- like 40 years, uh, and I'm probably younger than the average person involved uh, on a you know, daily basis in lighthouse preservation. That's not entirely true, but I'm um, kind of maybe somewhere in the middle. Sure. Uh, so again, we're trying to get more uh, younger people interested both to visit lighthouses, just to get them there in the first place, to have the kind of experiences you had when you were 11, 10 or what you said you were 10 or 11 when you first mm-hmm. vid- visited Portland Headlight. That happens to a lot of kids when they first visit lighthouses. They just kind of, a light goes off, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to get more young people to visit lighthouses and uh, part two, get maybe not so much kids, but get people in their 20s and 30s involved in whether it's volunteering or um, even, you know, there are there are jobs in the lighthouse field, just getting personally involved in helping to preserve lighthouses in one way or another or, and or to research the history and all, all that goes with it. So my question for you is, do you have any thoughts about how do we get younger people and in general a more diverse audience uh, interested in the lighthouses? My generation... What I've seen, we appreciate exclusivity and feeling like we're in on a secret. And so I think getting my generation or younger, even uh, I'm 33, almost 33. uh, I think it's about offering access to a lighthouse in a way that feels exclusive and special. Um, We also love happy hours. You know what I mean? It's like what... Can there can there be an event? Can there be an occasion where we um, are invited to have some sort of exclusive access? And on top of that, it's not only exclusive access and feeling like you're in on something that no one else is in on. It's having the opportunity to show that off, have social proof that you've been involved in something special and unique and exclusive. So, you know, if um, if uh, a Gen Zer or a millennial was able to show up at a lighthouse and create a TikTok video of this exclusive experience that no one else gets to uh, have, not they're advertising the lighthouse for you on TikTok, but they also have felt like they've been, um, you know, they're special in a way. We're special, and that's I think that's all you really need to do to make a millennial or a Gen Zer excited about something is make them feel like they're the only ones that get to do it. That is really interesting what you're saying. I, I, I like it a lot. And uh, I think you're probably right. Uh, I just uh, interviewed Emma Choi, who hosts a podcast for NPR, everyone and their mom. And I asked her basically the same question. And she said, have a party. Yeah. You know, throw throw parties at lighthouses. And you just said the same thing pretty much. <laughs> yeah. uh, throw us a happy you- hour and uh, tell us, you know, give us a hashtag and we'll go for it. Uh, lighthouse happy hour. I like yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to take that and try to try to run with it to some extent. I mean, it's it, it, lighthouse locations are all so different. There's such a, a wide range. You know, if you can't have a party so easily on a, at a lighthouse out on a rock, you know, five sure. miles offshore or something <laughs> like Halfway Rock in Casco Bay. But uh, a lot of them do lend themselves to this this kind of thing. And there are there are lighthouse fundraising events. Often they're high priced you know they might be fifty dollars or a hundred dollars a sort of uh, semi-formal fundraising event that type of thing but i like the idea of a, a more informal uh party um right on the grounds of the lighthouse that would be exclusive and that that kind of thing i do do oh, like that absolutely. idea a lot yeah pull up a, a food truck have someone mixing cocktails um you know, the the fundraising events, I think, are still out of reach for a lot of millennials and certainly Gen Zers. Um, you know, especially these days, we're paying off our student loans and trying to buy houses and, and all of that. So fundraising isn't al- always in reach for someone my age or younger, but we can pay 
with social currency. You know, we can make those social media posts for you and we can blow it up on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is. Um, so there's other ways to, you know, get the support of a younger demographic without them having to show up with their wallets. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Um, we have to some extent, we, when I say we, I'm talking about the U.S. Lighthouse Society made a uh, an effort in recent months or the last, especially the last year or two, I would say, at, uh, you know, more of a presence on social media, especially Instagram and TikTok. I mean, we're all pretty active on Facebook, but I know people of your age and younger tend What's not that? to even look at Facebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so old. It's like, uh, you know, it's it's like uh, black and white TV or something. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but we just had a, we had a, a contest where we invited people to do a dance at a lighthouse on TikTok. We had very few entries. Uh, unfortunately, same thing with the art contest we've been trying. We've we've had tr trouble making a dent in that. We need more influencers getting you know uh, getting involved in this and and helping to share these things. But there's also the question of even if you get thousands of uh, you know likes or looks at a at a post on TikTok or Instagram. For the most part, people are flipping through these things pretty quickly, and they're 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 liking them or whatever whatever. Very rarely even commenting on them, and very rarely going another step to doing anything other than just quickly looking at it. Um, so, uh, you know, events like you're talking about to actually get people involved that's that's a way of uh, taking it another step. But I'm not sure if there's a, a secret to getting people to do more than just just flip through a, a, a post quickly mm -hmm. on Instagram or TikTok. I don't know if you have, I, I, I don't know how deeply we can get into that right now, but uh, maybe it's something yeah. we can discuss as time goes on. You know, if there was a secret, I would certainly share it with you if I had figured it out yet. But I think with the, you know, social media, there's no recipe for going viral, but filling a bucket until it overflows it takes one drop of water at a time. And so even if they are just flipping through and watching your 15 second video and giving you a double tap to like it and moving on with their day, they've engaged in it in some way. Um, so it enters their consciousness at least. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So there's value there, but, uh, but social media certainly, it doesn't feel like it really makes a difference until you've got hundreds of thousands of, of views and, and whatever. But, um, it, it does the fact that uh, you're working on it that the that that it's out there and that's an, a, a strategy you're employing is important it's part of the strategy it's not the whole strategy we're sure. also talking about having national essay contests for kids and things like that sort of an old-fashioned way of approaching things but I think it's still important let me ask you to change the subject a little bit uh, what is and this is a huge question and I know it can't be answered in a, like in a minute but uh, <laughs> maybe if there's uh, one thing, especially one or two things that really spring to mind, what do you think is the key to producing a successful podcast? Well, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. I think a lot of people believe that podcast success comes from making your show for everybody, you know, casting a really wide net, talking about a really broad subject. Uh, but I think that actually deters more people because they don't know if the show is for them. And niching down like you have and niching down like I have, focusing on one geographic region within a podcast genre, which is true crime, I actually gave myself an opportunity to build up uh, respect and uh, loyal listenership within Maine, within New England, who knew me as the hometown girl who used to be on the radio. And just it's like we discount Maine because it's a small state. It's not New York City, but we still have hundreds of thousands of people here who can get excited about something. Um, so I think niching down actually gives you more success because a listener knows the show is for them. And so if you want to start a podcast, don't be afraid of getting really narrow and specific. Anyone can, you know, talk about the top five pop culture stories, but what are you going to bring to it that makes the listener know that that's the show for them that they're going to love? So I think niching down is a great strategy. Okay. Well, maybe I'm on the right track. I think you are. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I have a final question for you for bonus points. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about producing and hosting your podcast, Dark Down East? It's a very layered answer and I'll give you the short version. I have finally found a place and a purpose for my skills that can be very technical, very dry audio editing, interviewing, writing questions, things like that. I found a place and purpose for those skills that helps someone. 
There isn't a handbook given to a family who has lost a loved one to violent crime on what to do to get answers and justice. And so many of these families are advocating for themselves, especially in longstanding cold cases. And so I have this skill set that I can lend to them so they feel like their voice is being heard, that the legacy of their loved one is being honored, and to have a purpose for skills that otherwise have just been monetized in other ways for other people that haven't felt as important. Um, that's my favorite part to know that I have found a purpose, uh, for all these skills that I've spent so long honing. Um, and it, I've maintained relationships with so many of the families that I've spoken to and interviewed. And, uh, you know, we still chat from time to time and, um, it's just been an unexpected part of it, uh, coming it from, you know, from a journalistic, a journalistic background where you don't get involved with your sources and you don't create those connections. I've kind of been able to apply journalistic integrity in the storytelling um, while actually having a human relationship with the people that I'm working with. So um, that's been the, the best part about it. From where I sit, uh, having been on your podcast a couple of times and having you here, uh, you talk about your your skills. You have a lot of skills. I'm very impressed by what you do. You're thank you. You're an excellent journalist, producer, and host. So thank you, thank uh, you. Kermit. Congratulations on the success you've had with uh, both uh, Gold Digger, which you produce, and with Dark Down East, which of course you you host and produce. Uh, you do a great job. You really do. Thank you. So, you're very welcome. So, Kylie, thank you so much for joining me here today. I hope we can do it again sometime, and I look forward to maybe doing a part two of Haunted Lighthouses or something along those lines on your podcast oh, yeah. again sometime. Oh, yeah. It's a it's, lot of fun. I got to have you back. And thank you for having me. Uh, I, it's so much fun to be able to just talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad to uh, give you the chance to talk. Thank you so much, Kylie. Thank you, Jeremy. Kylie Lowe's podcast, Dark Down East, and the Gold Digger podcast can be heard using your favorite podcast app. Kylie has a website for her Dark Down East podcast. It's darkdowneast.com. This episode is really different from the usual, but I was able to discuss lighthouses quite a bit with both Kylie and Emma. Both of them suggested having parties or happy hours at lighthouses where people can just kind of hang out and have fun at a lighthouse. It's a, I think it's a really simple concept, but I also think it's an excellent idea. Uh, what do you think about that, Michelle? I think that sounds like a lot of fun. Definitely. Yeah, yeah I think it's in situations where uh, you have uh, easily accessible lighthouses, uh, probably on the mainland, although it could happen on an island too, but just to let a group of people, to let them just kind of hang out for maybe yeah. a couple hours or so, have some, have some music going on, serve some food. Uh, just kind of a low-key party kind of thing. I think right. it's a pretty cool idea. I yeah. think it's great. Yeah. So also, to change the subject a little bit, I want to mention the new book uh, that the U.S. Lighthouse Society has published. The title is The Lighthouse at Point San Luis. That's the Point San Luis Lighthouse in California. The author is Kathy Mastico. Uh, and uh, Michelle, you remember that we uh, we covered it a couple of episodes ago on this podcast. Yes. Yes. I also discussed it in uh, last week's episode with Cindy, our, my other co-host. It was my pleasure to be involved with the editing of the book, and Cindy Johnson was also involved. It's thoroughly researched, very well written. I recommend it to anyone interested in the lighthouses or California history. You can buy the book at pointsanluislighthouse.org, and it's also available on Amazon. Thanks, as always, to all the volunteers, staff, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society at Point No Point Light Station in Washington and around the world. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about tours, the passport program, preservation grants, and all the things the Society offers. Don't forget, donations and memberships help to support this podcast. The next two episodes of Lighthearted will feature a two-part interview with Nick Korstad and Kevin Farias, the past and present owners of Borden Flats Lighthouse in Fall River, Massachusetts. As always, to all our regular listeners and to our new ones, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Let it shine, let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine